Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody. I'm so sorry I <laughs> I'm late today, and uh, I I just got two words from uh, the speech, Professor Fan and uh, FFI. <laughs> I don't uh, understand any other words. Uh, yeah, I actually I visited Myanmar in 2010 when I first met the women. And uh, a few years later, he came to visit my uh, my site in China, and we spent uh, a few uh, a few days in the uh... oh. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can hear the, the Myanmar language, so maybe I, I need to turn off the, the translation first. So you should see a little button on the bottom of your screen for interpretation. And if you click on that and then switch it to off, then you won't hear his translation anymore. Okay. Uh, so today I will uh, uh, introduce the process uh, how we discovered the, the Skywalker given in China and uh, uh, what what we have done for the conservation of the species. As you uh, may all know, uh, the there were two species of uh, hulok gibbons. One is the eastern hulok, and then the other one is the western hulok. So the left one, the left photo is the eastern, uh, is a male of eastern hulok, and then the, uh, the, the right photo is the uh, western hulok. From these photos, we can see the uh, differences. So the eastern hulok, as a white beard and uh, the white brows are well separated, but uh, Western Hulu given the, uh, they don't have white beard, beard and the white brows are nearly collected. So <clears throat> this, I, I'll show you more photos of Eastern Hulu's. From these photos, we can clearly see the uh, white beard and uh, there are some uh, have some white hairs in uh, uh, around the eyes and nose. So the white brows are well separated. So especially another uh, distinguished characteristics of Eastern Hulok is the uh, uh, white tuft. So we can uh, see from these two photos. So this is a map to show the uh, distribu uh, distribution boundary of these two species. Uh, before we saw uh, the Chindwen River in Myanmar separates these two species. On the west bank of the river, uh, it's the range of Western Hulok. And uh, on the east bank of the Chindon River and the uh, Euro Adi River, the species is Eastern Hulok. So uh, this is this is China. So you you can say because this area is in the east bank of of Chindon River. So in the past. We thought the Hulok given population in China uh, was Eastern Hulok. But I, I started to study Hulok Gibbons in, uh, in, in China in, uh, in 2007. So at the beginning of my own project, we tried to habituate a few Gibbon groups so we can uh, collect behavior data and then design conservation plan for the species. But after we 
have had created several uh, a few groups we we got many opportunities to take pictures of these animals so from these photos you can see these gibbons look different from the typical eastern frogs because we can't see any white beard and uh, there are low white white hairs around the eyes in the orbit area so from these two photos we can also can only see the tuft is not white actually is brown or black uh, the same color as the as the body so <clears throat> I think maybe this species is different from the Eastern Hulok. We, uh, we tried to uh, took, uh, take pictures of as many, as, in, uh, as many individuals as we can. So we, uh, we, we went to different uh, forest patches to survey gibbons and we took photos of them. And we also visited several Chinese zoos to uh to to take pictures of captive individuals but you know it it was very difficult to take pictures of, of wild and habituated gibbons because they always uh flee away once they detect an observer so after several years we uh, we, we we finally got pictures of uh a few males and uh, females we can see from this uh photos we can see yeah no white beard no white hairs around the uh in the orbit area and uh, the white browns are even separated uh even wider than the eastern hulog so we can clearly see from these uh, photos. Yeah, these photos show the tuft of the males. So we can see this, the tuft of, uh, of this whole of are a lot white. And uh, we also found some morphological differences between whole in the mountain Gauligong and the uh, a typical Eastern Hulogs. These photos on the top are Hulog events from mountain Gaolikong. So we can see the white, the white hairs around the eyes and in the orbit area. And there's uh, obvious in the Eastern Hulog. So the, the bottom photos are a typical eastern hulok we can see they have they have many dense white hairs around the eyes that create a, a white mask on the face so 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 we uh, we thought maybe the the hulok gibbon population in mountain dolgong is a different species from eastern hulok so we uh, we then uh, measured the morphometrics of models of uh, specimens, and we also studied the uh, uh, studied the, the mitochondrial genome of different uh, individuals. So we have two uh, mitochondrial genome for. Hello. I think I'm you may have right lost now. his connection. Yeah, the fan lost the connection. Okay, we'll, we'll try to give him a, a, a few minutes to hopefully be able to rejoin.
who is rejoining now. Uh, sorry, my, my collection is not very well. And, uh, uh, Glad you could rejoin. Yeah, we're all ready <laughs> for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so now we have both uh, morphological, uh, morphological and the genetic evidences to support uh, new species. Uh, so uh, we, we, we named this species as a uh, Hulok Tianxin. Tianxin actually is, uh, uh, is a pinyin in China. If, uh, one, one moment, if, if you're able to press the, the share screen again, I think you may need to reshare your screen. Oh, okay. Thank you. So can you see my screen now? Not quite. Um, it's the green green button at the bottom. I, I can't see the, the Can you see? Ah, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, it's okay. in presenter mode. Great. Thank you. So, so I will start from this slide. Uh, do you uh, do you do you get an idea from this slide the genetic uh, differences between uh, Eastern Holoc and the, the, the population mountain Gauligong? So actually, from this uh, from this figure, we can see. And the Eastern Hulok, uh, Eastern Hulok, uh, Western Hulok, and the Gauligong, the, the Hulok given population in Gauligong is different. So uh, we, we decided to name it as a new species. And uh, after discussion between uh, authors, we, we decided to name it as Hulok Tianxin. Tianxin is pin in China, uh, which depicts uh, uh, that means uh skywalk in in chinese so uh that depicts the, the locomotion mode of the gibbons just like uh, walking on sky so i here i would like to show you a, a, a more photos to uh distinguish uh, this uh four different uh Taxa of Hulo Gibbon. Yeah, this is the Western Hulo Gibbon, and this is uh, uh, Miss Mianzis, uh, from from Miss Mi Mountain. Below, uh, uh, a recent paper uh, reported this subspecies is not valid. So, actually, this is a population of Western Hulo, and this is Eastern Hulo. And this is a uh, whole extension from Mountain Gauligong. So, uh, this is a holotype of whole extension, uh, which is uh, preserved in American Museum of Natural History. Uh, uh, 
This specimen was collected by Roy Chapman in April 5, uh, more than 100 years ago in Mountain Gargon. So from this uh, hilo, uh, holotype, so we can see, uh, yeah, the, the bottom photos are uh, the uh, type specimen, the holotype of uh, Hulok Leuconides, the Eastern Hulok species. So uh, we can see uh, the, the Hulok tension doesn't have white hairs in the orbital area, and the, there's no white uh, beard, and the, no, the, the tuft is also brown or black, yeah, compared to the Eastern Hulok. So this photo shows a white beard and this photo shows a white tuft of, uh, of Eastern Hulok. So, so now we, uh, we can confirm uh, the, the Western Hulok events is distributed uh, uh, on the west bank of Chindawan River and on the, the eastern Hulok is di distributed between the Chindawan River and the Irrawaddy River. So the, the Skywalk Gibbon is distributed along the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Emmerichai River. Yeah, this, uh, the, yeah, Irrawaddy River here. But we, uh, but we don't know if this area, which is shown in red in this figure, is Hulok given, uh, is a Skywalk Hulok given, or a, a different uh, taxa. Because during my uh, research of the taxonomy of Hulok Gibbons, we also found some photos of uh, hula gibbons like, like this. So they don't have white beard, they don't have white hairs in the orbit area, but they look quite different from the uh, skywalk hula gibbons we described in, uh, in Mountain Gorgon. So, yeah, so from, so this individual has a few, uh, has, has, has some white hairs, but, but he doesn't have the white beard. Yeah, this, this one. So I'm not very sure if this is a new uh, taxon from the south or from the east of Myanmar or just uh, uh, subadult individuals of uh, Eastern Hulok, but they are definitely not the Skywalk Hulok events. So, uh, I know you are going to do a field survey in uh, in, uh, in the coming months. So if you uh, if you uh, can take some photos of wild gibbons, or if you can collect some fecal samples, that would be very helpful to uh, identify the taxon of the hollow gibbon population in in the eastern part of Myanmar. So in the, sec the, the section of my presentation, I will talk about conservation of hula gibbons in China. So in, uh, in 1985, uh, there was a report about the hula gibbon population in China and uh, it reported the total population of this species was less than 200 individuals. In 1995, there was a second survey of the species and they reported less than 40 groups. But we can see, compare, uh, we, uh, we can see this second survey found a very, uh, not very large, but uh, a comparative large uh, subpopulation in Sudan which was not found uh, by the first survey. So you, you can see many uh, small isolated gibbon populations in Nongchuan. Yeah, in, uh, 
uh, extinct in the second survey. So in 2008 and 2009, uh, I conducted the, the third survey. We found many small populations uh, went to extinct in 2009. Yeah, and uh, the population, the, the whole population showed obvious sign of decline. Yeah, many, uh, you, you see this, this small populations went to extinction and this population, uh, the, the population size of this, this one, yeah, decreased from around 30 groups to only 10 groups. So the main threats to full organisms in, in China is uh, cardamom plantation. So from this photo, you can see uh, this is the cardamom. This is cardamom. So the local people uh, plant cardamom uh, and uh, and the of the forest. So to uh, grow cardamom inside the forest, they cut down some, some small trees uh, and uh, in the in the forest, which we uh, decrease food availability to gibbons and sometimes it will also create uh, forest canopy windows for gibbons, such as I show in this photo. So you can say uh, the local people grow cardamom along this valley. So gibbons can't jump from this tree to this tree. So they need to come down to the valley and then cross this tree to the other side of the valley. So they, uh, they have to travel a longer distance to find enough food. And uh, a lot of threats, a lot of threats is uh, charcoal making. So in 2009, I saw many uh, small factories in the rural area. People are people were making charcoals using woods collected from the forest. So commercial logging. There was one group uh, living in this area just before before our survey, but. Uh, after the commercial logging, this group disappeared. Farmland in Coachman. So in 2009, local people still uh, use slash uh, burn, uh, burn uh, to, to grow corns in the forest. So yeah, this is a lot of photo. And uh, in, uh, in the border areas of China, local people, especially uh, Nisu people, they believe the, the brain of Hologibans can be used to cure epilepsy of people. So once the once someone got an epilepsy, so they, they, they try to uh, hunt or, or buy the scars of, of hula gibbons. So you can say the, the hunters So we, we can see from, from, this, uh, from this photo, we can see there's eight scars of, of hula gibbons. So to prove this, this is a given scar, the hunters still keep the white bronze on the scale. Yeah. Uh, in, in 2010, um, more than 10 years ago, the price of one scar is uh, about 1,000 yuan. It's, uh, it's, 
equal to one one hundred and fifty US dollars. But now uh, uh, we we are uh, yeah after law in uh, enforcement we are uh, have we haven't seen this uh, given scars for several years. So in uh, 2007, we, conduct, uh, we, we, we did a, a fourth survey of, of hollow gibbons in China. And in two, uh, we, we just confirmed the existence of 34 groups and 10, uh, 23 individuals uh, in, in China. So we can say this, uh, the mass population of hollow gibbons in China was clearly isolated in several different uh, areas. The first subpopulation live inside the Gaoligong National Nature Reserve, which is shown in green in this uh, figure. So this is the first population, and this is the second population, and this is the third population. So we can say the 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 they are isolated by more than 40 kilometers and uh, in the middle of the nature itself is a ridge of mountain Gaoligong as higher above uh, than 3000 meters. So the Gibbons can't cross the ridge from the east ridge to the west ridge. And the and this population is outside the nature itself. So since 2009, uh, we tried to study given behavior in three different field sites. Uh, and finally, we habituated two given groups. We studied the habitat the uh, singing behavior, feeding behavior, ranging behavior, and sleeping behavior. So uh, we also monitor the climate and the uh, food availability uh, in, in two, two sites. So we can see there's remarkable seasonal variation in temperature and the uh, for the availability in our study sites. So in, in, in winter, in, uh, in cold winters from December to, to January to uh, February, we can see sometimes uh, the, the lowest temperature in our study site drops below zero. And uh, occasionally our study site uh, was covered by snow. So that means gibbons live in the forest with, with snow. And during the cold winters for three months, there was nearly no any fruits available for, for gibbons. So which means gibbons need to face both cold and uh, uh, fruit shortage for nearly three months at our study site. So we, uh, we set up 33 20 by 20 meter plots at Nankang, where cardamom plantation is common. And uh, we set up another 50 plots at Banchang, where cardamom is rare. So from the habitat survey results, we see cardamom plantation didn't reduce tree diversity. We recorded 102 tree species and uh, 16 yellow species at Nankang compared to 108 tree species and uh, 17 yellow species at Banchang. But the forest structure was changed by cardamom uh, plantation. So at Nankang, we can see the tallest trees were reduced, but in a second layer, from 10 to 20 meters high, 
the trees from 10, 10 to 20 meters high. So we uh, become more common at Nankang. So we, we also uh, monitor the same behavior of four groups over five years. And we, we found these gibbons called much less than other gibbon populations. On average, they just call, call once every three days or even 10 days. But they, but they call longer than other gibbon species. On average, they call 25 meters per boat. And they, they sound less in cold months and uh, when they had gum shorts or dog barking. So in an extreme uh, incident, uh, one of our study groups didn't call for 62 days after they had gum shorts. We, we thought maybe this, this group's uh, all members in this group were hunted by, by hunters, but after 62 two days, this group called again and uh, we, we, we found them. So if you, uh, if, you went, if you go to a forest to do a given survey, you need to consider the hunting pressure in the study site uh, in, in areas with very high hunting pressure. Gibbons may call less often. So and we, we, uh, after habituation, we, we, we studied the feeding behavior of these groups. And, uh, but right now, I have not yet analyzed the feeding behavior data of the group at uh, Banchang. So this, uh, here I show you the, the results uh, of the Nankan group. This group consume uh, leaves or fruits from 66 different species. And only 60, 60, 66, uh, 36 species provide figure or fruit for gibbons. And when fruit was not available, they consume the more leaves and they increase the feeding time. Uh, when temperature was very it was low in cold winters, they also increased the resting and the decreased travel. Some some days when temperature was really low, they they left their sleeping trees at ten at ten p.m. and uh, came back to. Uh, sleep trees in the uh, in in three p.m. in the afternoon. So that means they just uh, uh, forage for four to five hours and uh, travel around three hundred meters. So this is a ranging pattern of the. The, the group at Nankang, the annual home range was uh, 93 hectares for, for this group. And the, the Banchang group occupied the uh, Najee home range, it was uh, 160 hectares. On average, they travel, uh, they travel 1,200 meters per day. So as I just told, some days they just they, they, they just traveled 350 meters, but uh, when fruit was abundant, they they moved a longer distance to to forage food. So we also compared the uh, the behavior of our two study groups uh, that live in forest with or without cardamom plantation. So from these figures, we can see the group 
live in the cardamom forest, increased feeding time, but they consume much more leaves than the group living in the forest without cardamom. And the, the, the group living in the, in the cardamom forest also decreased traveling in June, July, and August. So, because in the well preserved uh, forest at Ban Chang site, there were more fruit available to gibbons in these three months. So, the Ban Chang group traveled longer than the Nankang group. So we also studied the sleeping behavior and uh, we published two papers uh, on this topic. Uh, one is uh, one, yeah, one in uh, International Journal of Primatology and uh, the other one in American Journal of um, Primatology. Because this uh, is not very, uh, is not close related to conservation issues. So uh, I, I won't go to details of the sleeping behavior. If you are interested, uh, I can send you this uh, papers later. But uh, I was, we, we, uh, we found that the, uh, the Nankang group that live in the cardamom for, uh, forest, they have, uh, they, their sleeping trees are short than, uh, uh, than the sleeping trees of the Banchang group. So that means uh, cardamom, cardamom plantation also uh, pose a negative effect on, on the sleeping behavior of gibbons. So this figure shows a habitat quality evaluation of the whole uh, population in, in China. So the, the darker the, the patch is, uh, the bad quality uh, for, for gibbon groups. So we can see this, there are four different Populations isolated by more than 10 kilometers. So this circle, the, the big circle is 10 kilometers with a radius of 10 kilometers. Uh, the small circle is, uh, is uh, five kilometers. Uh, the, the radius of the smaller circle is five kilometers. So we can see There are four different uh, small subpopulations. And even, so I, I want to show you more details of the, the, the population outside the nature of, but you can see the, this black triangles are villages in the area. So we can see even for this uh, subpopulation, the Gibbon groups are also isolated. This population will be separated to two populations. So we allow uh, doing some conservation education along this. Uh, along the, the China-Myanmar international border in this area. So in, uh, during the 2017 population survey, we uh, conducted population survey. interview surveys in these areas. So we try to, to connect it information about the livelihood, uh, attitude, perception of local people, to gibbons. So we uh, classified our studies uh, area into four different types. Uh, the first area yeah, is A. A means gibbon populations living uh, outside the nature of area B is gibbon populations 
live inside nature reserve. Area C is no gibbons outside the nature reserve. D is no gibbons but inside the nature reserve. So we try to interview uh, six people per village. In total, we uh, interviewed more than 600 local villages from around 100 uh, villages. So this, uh, this is our, uh, these are our results. So we can see uh, in area A, there are more these two people compared to B and C. So, and then uh, there's Han people living in area A. In area A, many, mo mo the majority of local people grow cardamom in the forest. And then they also collected long timber uh, forest products from the, from the, from the forest. But with, so in, in not to grow cardamom inside the forest. So the local people in area A, they preserve forest close to the village. So the forest cover in area A is even higher than the, uh, than the, uh, than in the Amazon, yeah. the Togo. And the area D. Whereas inside or close to the nature zone. And uh, in area A, the local people don't hunt gibbons because of a traditional hunting taboo, because these this people believe uh, gibbon, they have many different uh, stories of gibbons, and they believe some, some of local people believe uh, gibbon is the uh, ancestor of, of Nisu people, or gibbon is a god of all animals because they never go to uh, drink water in the, in the river. Other primate species serve them with, with water and others said gibbons can predict, can forecast weather. So, and others said uh, gibbon thing is, uh, is very beautiful with Nikon. So, uh, this area is far away from the county town and uh, more Nisu people and fewer Han people live in this area. And they have a tradition uh, or culture not to hunt gibbons. So, uh, due to the, the uh, traditional hunting taboos, gibbons still survive in this collective forest. But in, in area B, this forest is protected by, by Chinese law because this is a uh, nature reserve. So due to uh, law enforcement, both forests and gibbons are protected inside the nature reserve, in nature reserve. So, uh, this study showed how traditional ecological knowledge can contribute to endangered species conservation. So during, during your uh, own survey, maybe you can also collect some data about local people's uh, traditional or local ecological knowledge. So, uh, in 2015, we uh, created uh, a small NGO, a small local NGO with my, my, my friends. Uh, we use uh, uh, the, the, the Skywalk Hulu Gibbon as a logo of our NGO. And the, the aim of this NGO is to conserve uh, the Skywalk Hulu Gibbon and the habitat in China. The English name of Miss NGO is Cloud Mountain Conservation. Yeah, this is a logo of our NGO. And uh, last year, we uh, uh, 
uh, we filled uh, a natural documentary about the skywalk holograms. So if you are interested, you can you maybe you can find it on the internet. Uh, the, the English name of this uh, documentary is a song for laugh, an ape with a ape. So in this documentary, uh, we introduce the, the ecology and behavior of holograms. We also focus on the conservation of the species. We introduced the um, stress the hologram population in China are facing and we, we try to use the uh, app to attract gibbons to uh, disperse in the forest. And uh, we also did uh, many outreach and uh, education in uh, primary schools, uh, in middle schools, and, uh, uh, and every year we we would, we did some outreach in in different city zoos uh, in the international Gaben Day. These photos were were, were, were taken uh, two years ago when we uh, did outreach in Beijing Zoo. Yeah. So and that's all. Uh, Thank you very much.